the very first hospitals in human history that incorporated mental health or psychiatric institutions were within the hospitals of the Muslims. What do you know about psychology? And do you think Islam has anything to do with it? One Park Network sat down with one of the world's leading Muslim professionals in the field of psychology. Her name is Dr. Rani Awad. She's a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at Stanford University and is also the director of Stanford's new Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. She's making breakthrough discoveries, unearthing the lost legacy of Islam, rewriting the history of psychology all together as we speak. Here's the story that you need to hear. When I first discovered Islamic psychology, I was looking through the books of the early great scholars who had written about psychology in search for what it is that they understood about mental illness. I was looking through the books of physicians, early Muslim physicians, to see what did they say. And I came across a book from the 9th century by Abu Zayd al-Balkhi called Masalih al-Abdani wal-Anfus. Today, part of that book is translated the second half under the title sustenance of the soul. Al-Balkhi is from the 9th century, and he took great lengths to write about physical medical illnesses and then also mental illnesses in the second half of his book. And as I was reading this book, I looked at the different chapters, and one of the chapters really caught my attention. Today, as a trained psychiatrist, as reading this, I thought to myself, this looked like obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Down the hall from me, where I was training at Stanford University, was one of the main important people in the field of OCD. Somebody had written the main textbooks on this very topic. And so I went down the hall, knocked on his door, and said, I think I found something here about OCD from much, much earlier than we study in our field of psychology. In the field of psychology, the illness called OCD is often written about as a modern disorder something that was not discovered until the 19th century. Or its very early case description, but not fully fleshed out, was written about in the 16th century. But here I was reading something in the 9th century that looked very much like OCD. And when I said this to my professor, he said, no, 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 it can't be. We've written everything there is to write about OCD. And I said to him, but can you read in Arabic? He said, no. <laughs> Can you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, then go translate it and come back. And I did. I took up the challenge, translated that section of Al-Balkhi's book. And something that was so interesting is as I was writing the different uh, classification and diagnosis of that particular illness, it reminded me so much of the way it was written about in the DSM, which is the manual that psychiatrists or psychologists diagnose from. And I did a comparison between the DSM-5 and between Al-Balkhi's criteria for obsessions. And side by side, you could see he got every single point correct. I took this back to our professor and he was ecstatic, so happy. Not for the Muslim excitement of, wow, an early Muslim scholar figured this out. In his case, for the scientific advancement of understanding the trans-historical benefit of knowing that this constellation of symptoms existed back much, much earlier than we expected. And he actually advised to publish this. And alhamdulillah, the paper has now been published. You can find it in the Journal of Affective Disorders, in which we talk about how Balkhi is likely one of the first in history to understand, classify, diagnose, and treat obsessive compulsive disorder. And similar papers like this in the Journal of Affective Disorders and Journal of Anxiety Disorders and the like, in which we were able to show how some of the early Muslim scholars were really at the forefront of the mental health field and really understood this and worked towards its treatment and its benefit. So we Muslims should also be proud of this legacy and understand our heritage and be able to rewrite the narrative correctly in making sure that Muslims are part and parcel of the history of psychology and its benefit going forward. Muslims should be proud, but it's not just OCD and Imam al balkhi There's so much more when it comes to the contributions of Muslims in this space that no one is talking about. Muslim scholars of the past truly understood psychology and mental health. This is where it gets interesting. The scholars of our Islamic tradition have spent a great deal of time trying to understand the human psyche, to really understand what it is that makes the human tick. And to do that, it was a very interdisciplinary understanding. Historically, this field was called ilmun nafs, the study of the soul. And the reason it was really targeted in this way is you'll see that it's no different than the word psychology that we use today. In the Greek roots of the word psychology, the psyche is also the soul 
the breath or the spirit, and logia is the study of. So you see, the study of the soul, or in Arabic, ilmun nafs, is the same word as psychology historically. The reason this is important is because the early Muslim scholars derived that interest in understanding how the human psyche worked directly from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. What do they derive this from? If you look at the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that says, that for every illness Allah has sent to earth, He's also sent a cure or a treatment. This was an impetus for the early Muslim scholars to search and understand whatever illness they saw in front of them in society, and they did not discriminate or make a distinction between physical illnesses and mental illnesses. Why is that important? Modern psychology today is often limited to cognitive and behavioral sciences to the exclusion of the spiritual. And definitely, they are interested in the empirical, just like the early Muslim scholars, but they are not invested in anything that is scriptural, something that is sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like we as Muslims or any people of faith may take from scripture. For that reason, modern psychology today often is called that it's lost its soul. Because where once it had, was interested in studying the soul, in fact, the origins of the word literally mean the study of the soul, it lost this in modern Western psychology. Mostly because people would say it can't be reproduced or empirically studied in labs, or you can't touch it or look it under an MRI machine. However, we would agree that there are illnesses that are very much important to study and to find treatment for, such as depression and anxiety and trauma and the like. But also, diseases of the heart, envy, greed, avarice, pride, all of these two need to be dealt with as well. The concept of ilm nafs that interdisciplinary understanding that the Muslim scientists created, took into account all of these. It took into account the biological, genetic. It took into account the social, environmental. It took into account the rational and the empirical and the scriptural spiritual. When you look at this very holistic understanding of the human being, you also see that what the early Muslim scholars created was a holistic treatment system for when a human is not doing well. When we start to really have mental turbulence, then we must treat it holistically and not just from one direction. Why is this important also? Because when you look at the theory that the that Islamic scholars created in terms of ilm al nafs you also see it didn't just stop at theory, it went into practice. Theory to practice is very important. For me, one of the trademarks, one of the things that are very clear that our early Muslim scholars took that theory, that very interdisciplinary understanding of the human psyche, and put it into practice, were their healing institutions. The healing institutions in Arabic, Dar shifa be literally the house or place of healing, or using the Persian origin of the word bimar, or illness, stan, meaning location, the bimaristans, then became known as the healing centers or the hospitals that the early Muslims created. From as far back as the time of the Prophet وسلم, who ordered that the first Bimaristan, which was a mobile unit, move along with wherever the expeditions were happening as Muslims are traveling through different lands so that the ill can be taken care of. Then, in early Muslim history, you find that the first of the Bimaristans that are standing happened, took place as early as the 8th century. And by the 9th century, you absolutely have these very massive healing institutions that had in them sections, just like they were able to treat internal medicine and your organs, anything lungs and heart and GI tract related. You also had sections related to healing of the eye diseases, healing of traumatology or anything related to broken bones, and a section on psychiatry, mental health. To our knowledge and our research that we do at my lab, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, we've worked on actually researching this very topic. And to our knowledge, the very first hospitals in human history that incorporated mental health or psychiatric institutions were within the hospitals of the Muslims. Why? Why was that? Because you find that holistic understanding of mental well-being. Just like the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, said, لِكُلِّ دَاءٍ دَوَاءٍ For every illness, there is a treatment. It did not discriminate between physical illnesses 
or mental illnesses, all of which were treated and all of which had their sections within that healing institution. The Dara Shifa or the Bibaristan, today the shortened Latinized word for that is Maristan. And Maristan is very important because wherever you go in the Muslim world, just like you see the spread of wherever Islam went, you find masajid or places of worship, you find madrasas or places of teaching, especially Islamic knowledge, you also find Maristans. From one end of the Muslim empire, Ummah, all the way to the other end, it is a trademark of our Islamic legacy and history. We as modern Muslims today, when we ask, well then what happened? If we had all of this understanding of psychology, and we had actual implementation of that, say, that theory into practice, and you had institutions of healing, within it you had treatment centers and actual treatments. You had the talk therapies. Yes, talk therapies and Muslims are some of the first to utilize that for healing mental illnesses. You also had medications and the compounding of medications. One of the institutions, part of this Madistan, is the Sharab Khana, which was basically the area in which you make, create medications for illnesses, physical and mental. And you had sections within this Madistan as well that were dedicated to spiritual well-being. It was holistic in its understanding. So you had the talk therapies that had in it cognitive and behavioral changes. You also had the spiritual and religious therapies as well. You also had in it the use of all of your senses to be treated. So every one of these madistans, one of their trademarks are fountains, beautiful fountains in which the sound of water, using sound therapy, the sound of water itself was healing. They were put in places in which there was a lot of greenery and a lot of beauty so that the eyes could also heal the turbulent soul. You also had in this other forms of sound therapy, such as the use of the maqam, the maqamat or the tones. Today, people might call this music therapy or sound therapy. And what they did with this is they would help raise or elevate a person who was feeling depressed and calm a person down who was feeling anxious. All of this was written about by the greats. Al-Farabi, for example, wrote great work related to the tones and their use in treating mental illness and customizing that per patient. You have wonderful writings about Abu, from Abu Zayd al-Balkhi in the 9th century, who put into great use the concept of the talk therapies, where he says, if a person had an obsessive illness, which today we might call OCD, and some of the papers I've directly written on al-Balkhi talk about this, where he says, use a form of therapy that today we would call exposure therapy, that gradual, little by little, a person's obsessions would come down, or phobias, where a person's fears would also be able to be diminished. And then the use of spiritual remedies, where he reminds us, and many of these scholars that have written on the psyche remind us, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us an illness, he also sent a cure. And reminding us to seek out help, because of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says, Tadawu ibad Allah. Seek out treatments, O servants of Allah. This understanding is what allowed such greatness to happen. And where we then lost this is also a loss of understanding our heritage, our legacy. Unfortunately, many, many factors contributed to the loss of the Madistans and this knowledge in general. Part of it had to do with colonization. Part of it had to do with political instabilities. Part of, it, part of it had to do with us as Muslims having that kind of mindset that the secularized concepts are better than the religiously informed. And unfortunately, part of that is also on us. The onus is on us, not knowing our own legacy, our own heritage, our own history. And so inshallah, my hope with all of this is that we get to revive our legacy, that we reclaim that heritage and that we rewrite the narrative that has mostly written Muslims out of the history of psychology when we have done so much actually and we're really at the forefront of it. But that's on us to rewrite the narrative, inshallah.